Hello and welcome to Creepy Puppets Presents. I'm your Creepy Puppeteer, Tommy. So, since my system crashed two weeks ago and trying to restructure the channel in the past week, I've decided to move all my science and religion content under one new show name, The Science Medium. So, um, welcome to The Science Medium Show. I am your science medium, Tommy. So I thought for our introductory episode, I would discuss the opposition, the rational skeptic movement. I have no problems with reason or skepticism, but the rational skeptic movement, which is intersected very closely with the atheist movement, is often irrational and not skeptical. They are often fanatical materialists and committed logical positivists. The rational skeptic often treats any philosophical criticism of his view as being beneath consideration. A month or two ago, I, I got into it with some hoity-toity PhD in philosophy, a seminary theologian. And I started this conversation by presenting what I thought was you know, inarguable evidence of evolution. These are just straight out facts that you can't deny. And he's trying to deny every one of them. And he denied them all collectively by asking me this question, how do you, how did he, how did he phrase it? How do you uh, reconcile materialism with idealism? Whenever I hear a question like that, I think, here we go. We're going to use smoke and mirrors to change the subject and thus avoid it. Because what he's actually asking me is how do I, how do I account or, or how could I be sure that anything that I perceive to be real is really real? And how, I, how do I account for the possibility, as if there is one, that everything that I perceive to be real isn't some kind of illusion? Um, I don't think that is even possible. Uh, but even if it is possible, I still think that it's an absurdity beneath serious consideration. This <laughs> the infinitely more parsimonious explanation is that reality is what it is, what it appears to be, and that we should consider that reality is, barring any evidence to the contrary, reality is real by definition. And the rational skeptic will often ignore evidence that disagrees with his position. Why is citing peer-reviewed studies? that look at intrinsic religiosity, a dodge. And the rational skeptic will often engage in logical fallacies like a straw man and refuse to correct them when presented with the fact that these are logical fallacies. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. If you couldn't guess by the title and the clips I just showed, I think that there's one person in the rational skeptic movement who exemplifies most of the problems with the movement in one package. That would be atheist YouTuber and Rob Zombie cosplayer Aaron Ra. Now, Aaron Ra said a whole bunch of absurd shit throughout his years and years of atheist activism, but he recently released a video, a three part video series, an hour and a half long altogether, entitled You Don't Know There's a God. Well, yes, I, I don't know there's a God, but I really can't know anything. That would be the position of consistent skepticism. And since he won't debate someone like me, you know, someone who's critical of positivism and materialism, uh, this is my chance to, to go through this supercut of all of his absurd nonsense and respond to it point by point. I am a descriptive spiritualist. I believe in the reality of spirits and their ability to communicate with us. And I'm a panendeist. I believe in an existent God who is the foundation of the being of the universe, uh, who doesn't interact with his creation, but we can experience him through inner mystical uh, meditative experiences, uh, and who generally wants us to be good and does promote some kind of justice after death. Now, if you're an atheist, I understand. I am not trying to convert you to my beliefs. I'm not asking you to. I understand that we really can't choose our beliefs. I was a hardcore atheist and anti-theist for 10 years, and it took lots of experiences and lots of events that converted me from those positions to my present positions. But the reason that I do hold these positions was verified personal experience. I had real experiences of the paranormal, and through meditation, real experiences of the Brahmanic divine. And I find 
that when I speak to other people who have mystical experiences or other people who have had mediumistic experiences, and I'm not talking about the ones you see on TLC, I'm talking about genuine mediumistic experiences, I find that our experiences are really consistent. So this is a kind of verified personal gnosis. I also hold the God belief in particular because I think that it works as an axiomatic belief as well as an appeal to the best explanation belief. If you're out there and you don't believe, uh, I completely understand, but I do want you to examine your own position for any potential irrationality. So let's get into it, shall we? Uh, the word correct is defined as free from error in accordance with fact or truth. None of that applies to Christianity. So are you implying that nothing Christianity holds is correct, even incidentally correct? Which is divided into tens of thousands of vo often violently conflicting denominations due to differences in interpretation and speculation. And I'm sure your interlocutor believes that the other Christian denominations are wrong. There's also ecumenism, which suggests that there is more in common between denominations than opposed to them. Open war between Catholics and Protestants is largely a relic of the past. So it's definitely not free from error, and I would argue that it is entirely erroneous, because there's no truth to it, meaning there's nothing you can show to be true about it. The truth is what the facts are, and you don't have either one. I agree that Christianity is erroneous, but that doesn't mean that religion itself is erroneous. Christianity is incoherent because the Old Testament clearly teaches a works-based system of salvation, and there's no obvious requirement for sacrifice for the atoning of sin. Those sacrifices were purely for ritual purity. So I agree that Christianity is erroneous, but that doesn't imply that all religious belief similar to Christianity or all forms of Christianity, like Christian deism, are incorrect. Yet you're supposed to believe it anyway, without question, reservation, or reason, because it's a faith-based belief system with required beliefs and prohibited beliefs, where free thought, one of the most basic of all human rights, is denied by religion and criminalized as damnable heresy or apostasy. Faith is not a reliable path to truth at all, but it's a great way to stay wrong forever, being fooled by lies and never knowing any better, which is what faith is all about. Consequently, any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. But I accept that my position of science-minded rational skepticism combined with secular humanism counts as a worldview by your definition, and my worldview is demonstrably correct. No, it isn't. Being the only one in accordance with facts and truth where your worldview is not remotely. So there is a correct worldview, but it's mine and definitely not. So you have an answer for that hoity-toity philosopher then? Well, I don't have a soul and neither do you. Well, that's a delightful assertion. I just finished a 50 episode educational video series explaining human evolution in detail and it's simple enough even for high schoolers to understand. I'll put the link to that playlist below. So this is a point where I'm actually going to give Aaron Ra a bit of credit. His science content is really good and quite accurate. But when he speaks on topics outside of that, he is mostly, to use a phrase he says later. Here in Texas, as you know, we call that talking out of your ass. Now, things happen because of cause and effect of often complicated processes, but not because of an invisible man pulling levers behind a curtain. And Christian scholars have debated how much God actually intervenes in his creation. Deists like myself hold that he doesn't intervene at all, that the dice once thrown are thrown, and why do kids get cancer? Because that's how the dice landed. While I would argue that morality is not a necessary aspect of one's worldview, I do happen to have what I think is a fairly objective moral standard to determine that. An atheist defending objective morality is kind of weird, especially since there are theists who have defended nihilistic or subjective morality with quite a bit more philosophical rigor than you seem to be able to muster. And I've never heard a Christian define what morality even is, much less how we should know what is or is not moral. They say they have an objective moral standard, but it always turns out to be the subjective opinion of whoever is pretending to speak for or interpret their God's subjective opinion. 
which is why subjectivist ethics do exist in more nuanced varieties of Christianity. However, in Matthew 19, Jesus said that if you would enter life to keep the following commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you take this with the two commandments issued to all the descendants of Noah in Genesis 9, to refrain from murder and to refrain from torturing animals, then we have a Christian version of the Noahide laws. That seems like a pretty reasonable base morality. Notice that Jesus doesn't require belief in God to enter into his kingdom in his own words. When you or I die, our thoughts and memories, our dreams and interests, our talents and aptitudes, everything that was once us will be reduced to a few dozen pounds of ape meat going bad. The only advantage you have over me is that when your brain shuts off forever, just like when you go under general anesthesia for surgery, your consciousness will blink out of existence permanently before you even have the opportunity to be disappointed. Belief in cessation of consciousness is a really weird position for an empiricist to hold. After all, no one has actually experienced the cessation of consciousness. There are times between which and before which I can't remember, but I obviously existed during those periods. I don't cease to be Descartes style when I go under general anesthesia. So to posit that consciousness is ceasing to exist is something that I think is a positive claim for which, as you point out, requires some defending. But that's how it should be. I've never heard any description of a posthumous eternity, even in heaven, that didn't sound like an insufferable damnation with no hope of escape. And some Christians say, well, no, we'll be happy all the time, and we wouldn't have desires or ambitions anymore, because you wouldn't be you anymore. So there's no point in going on. If all that was really real, which it thankfully isn't, then in your first gazillion years, you'd already be pleading for some way to just let it end. And Christians talk an awful lot about hell, but they don't discuss heaven very much because it doesn't take very long to realize that your impossible promise of a posthumous paradise is just another Hotel California. Thanks, but no thanks. Frankly, I'd rather just die and stay dead completely. Awesome alliteration. So this goes back to the experience thing. Anyone who has done serious work in meditation has probably experienced the somatic, a state of conditionless consciousness, a state of meditation where time and being and active thought ceases to exist. Those who have experienced it, and I have as well, describe it as as close to paradise as one can be, and that lasts only for a small period of external time. The Buddhas and the Hindu mystics all describe enlightenment as essentially being somatic forever. Yes, the person dies with the somatic experience, but in Eastern religions, that's the point. And, you know, Christianity has a tradition of losing oneself in uh, the body of Christ. So there is certainly a Christian position from within which one can say that heaven is about a state of consciousness which is apart from our painful conditioned experience now. now. First of all, Christianity doesn't actually answer any of these questions. It only provides baseless speculation according to fairy tales that we know for certain did not really happen. Not to be pedantic, but even false answers are answers by definition, and even if they're based on stuff that didn't happen, that doesn't mean the answers provided by Christianity, or any other worldview for that matter, are necessarily wrong. Yet we're expected to believe it anyway, and take it on faith just because you say so. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. No. Wrong answers are not answers at all. And we can't say that any of these excuses actually count as answers until we can show the truth of it and show that they are. But secondly, we can't show the truth of it because there isn't any. All religious beliefs fall into one of two categories, not evidently true and evidently not true. Accuracy and accountability are paramount in my worldview where they don't even matter at all in yours. Well, you seem unconcerned with accuracy when it comes to representing your interlocutor's position. Also, I'm still waiting for an answer to the hoity-toity philosopher's question. And third, Christianity isn't the only worldview that pretends to answer these questions. Every religion makes that claim, and not just the Abrahamic faiths like Judaism, Islam, and Baha'i, all of which you simply ignore because they refute your point. 
Zoroastrianism answers each of these questions too, or it claims to, just like Christianity does, and so does Sikhism. Hinduism probably gives the best and most comprehensive answers because they're the oldest religion in continuous practice, so they've had the most practice. And they have the biggest volume of religion in that the Bhagavad Gita is but one chapter of the Mahabharata, the world's largest epic poem, and that's just one book out of a whole library of sacred scriptures dedicated to the Hindu pantheon. Let's talk for a minute about Hinduism. So Hinduism was an essential component of my coming to the possibility of a belief in God when I read the Upanishads, which are an ancient Hindu philosophical text that are among the most sacred scriptures in the religion. What do Hindus believe, at least those who are deep into the philosophical and theological aspects of Hinduism? Well, Hinduism teaches that God exists and matter doesn't, that matter is just an illusion. Uh, the word in Sanskrit is maya that the real reality, the reality we, we can experience ourselves, that is true, is the inner experience. The inner experience of the Atman, the inner experience of God. This is not unlike the hoity-toity philosopher who asks you how you know that material world actually exists and isn't an illusion. Now, in the 1700s, the eminent philosopher Immanuel Kant developed something similar to this. He posited the difference between the world as it really is, the noumenal, and the phenomenal, the way the world appears to be, and asked the question, how well can we be sure that these two worlds match up? And he posited that we could maybe only know it in one case, and that was the case of the self, because there is a noumenal version of the self and a phenomenal version of the self. These two, he says, are connected by the will. Thus, the will is the means of knowing something true about the self, and therefore the only thing we can know about the noumenal world. Evolutionary biology, and I've talked about this many times, evolutionary biology has finally started to confirm the Kantian idealist view. We've always known that there's some aspect of structuring that our brains impose on to reality, but the question was always how much structuring was that? Can we overcome that structuring using our scientific instrumentation, or does that structuring corrupt even the very calibration of our scientific instruments? Well, recently studies in evolutionary biology have shown that it's in fact this deep corrupting type that we really should be doubtful of all of our senses and all of the calculations based on our senses that essentially evolution is telling us that all other science is wrong. How do we respond to that? Well, that's what a deeply philosophical person would look to. In my case, upon coming to doubts with materialism, I thought, well, there are religions, thousands of years old in Hinduism's case, that openly believe this, so let's go and look at what they have to say. Evolution isn't a worldview. Christianity is because it's a religion, and all religions count as worldviews. We could also say that materialism or philosophical naturalism is a worldview too, and that's the contrast you should have alluded to. I wrote a book on the foundational falsehoods of creationism. I'll put a link to that too. The very first of those falsehoods is the idea that one must either reject God to accept some scientific facts like evolution, or that one must reject evident realities in order to believe in the Bible, as if the Bible is God. That's binary thinking, and it's wrong. I remember when the global statistics were that most evolutionists are Christian, and most Christians are evolutionists. And yet you're a hard anti-theist, so you believe that those people are irrational too. There's no meaningful difference between an evolution-believing Christian and a creationist Christian, because to you, they're both equally wrong. And since then, Religions in general, and Christianity in particular, have been in steep decline in every single state and around the world, while atheism and religious extremism have both been on the rise following recent trends toward dangerous polarization. Actually, the fastest growing category of no religious affiliation, studies of this group indicate that they're mostly deists, my camp, so we're winning. A theory is not a wild guess of baseless speculation like religion is. Every modern scientific theory is both a fact and a body of knowledge or field of study enveloping all available data, including all related hypotheses and even natural laws to explain that basic fact. I would posit that most religions have their basis in people's perceptual experience. 
And certainly it's not the case that all religions, or even most religions, require you to believe it without evidence. Most religions want you to have a direct experience with the same body of experiences that fueled the religion's creation in the first place. Take the famous quote by the Buddha that uh, he wanted everyone to experience what he had and not take what he said because he said it. I know you know this quote because here's a clip of you quoting the Buddha's quote. Just because it prohibits free thought, makes one susceptible to deception by design, and because the doctrine itself is misleading and teaches dangerous things with detrimental effects. Before you make these confident pronouncements on matters you've obviously never studied, you should at least consult a scientist, preferably someone who works in one of the fields relevant to evolution. Oh, I think I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of that clip. Pity that you don't know what a soul is either. Why is it that I have to know both sides of this argument better than believers know their own alone? It's apparent you don't really know either side very well, Aaron. You've got the soul confused with consciousness, but they're not the same thing. Try to understand that only about a third of scientists in the United States still believe in God. And now think about the fact that a significant percentage, half or most, neuroscientists don't believe we have a soul. But of course they have some understanding of how the physical brain produces consciousness. Even the few neuroscientists who do believe in God still understand that physical trauma or drugs can manipulate and even permanently alter our personalities, proving that our personalities are physical too. So even if we are only matter without a literal ghost in the machine such as you imagine, you still would be a person with feelings, with or without a soul. And we don't have a soul, by the way. I, I can go into more detail about that later, but this video is already too long. So this is a common conflation that skeptics make all the time. Consciousness is not equivalent to qualia. Consciousness is all of the collective experience, but the qualia is the subjective experience, the sense of myself as self, self-awareness. It's an open question whether or not we could have consciousness without qualia. In philosophy, we call this the philosophical zombie problem. Now this is an in-depth topic that requires a lot of uh, understanding and debate back and forth. So, like, that's obviously a debate worth having. But I will say that in the ancient Near East, where the Christian worldview developed, there was a belief in the plurality of the components of the soul. We read in the Bible about the Ruach, the spirit, which is distinct from the Nefesh, the part of the soul that seems to be a copy of the memories. This is analogous to the neighbors of the Hebrews, the Egyptians, who had many parts of the soul, but primarily the Ba and the Ka. The Ba was like one's memory, and the Ka was the root of one's consciousness. So do I hear straw man again? I like to use an objective standard that was eloquently summarized by fellow activist Scott Clifton. Here's what I understand the terms morally right and morally wrong to mean. A particular action or choice is moral or right when it somehow promotes happiness, well-being, or health, or it somehow minimizes unnecessary harm or suffering, or it does both. A particular action or choice is immoral or wrong when it somehow diminishes happiness, well-being, or health, or it somehow causes unnecessary harm or suffering, or again, it does both. I think everyone in the world agrees with this basic definition, and we can use that to show that the God of the Bible is often objectively immoral. So I'm a moral nihilist in the Nietzschean sense. I subscribe to the meta-ethical theory of error theory. That is, all moral claims represent propositions, but those propositions are false in the realist sense. So every time William Lane Craig says, if God does not exist, then objective morality doesn't exist, I will add, yes, and even though God exists, objective morality does not exist. Objective morality is incoherent. Objective morality requires that I have goals that I don't actually have. I both have goals and don't have goals at the same time. So it's ironic that I, as someone who believes in God, is more morally nihilistic than the atheist. But also, again, there is a wide variety of opinions on morality within Christian theology. I interpret religious morality to be goal-oriented. If you want to be saved, you have to do this. It's not an objective standard. This is clearest in Buddhism. If you want to be enlightened, you've got to walk the Eightfold Path and follow our moral precepts. It's not like these moral precepts are the ultimate good written into the fabric of reality. The funny thing about Christianity, though, 
Is it your personal God that lives in your head, hates all the same things that you do for the same reasons that you do? And your God in your head always understands and accepts whatever excuses you use to justify whatever it was that you did. That's why your personal God always forgives you, even when you snuck into that guy's house and shot him. Because you had to. Yeah, I know. Well, poisoning fallacy. Also, a common trope in the Christian conversion narrative is how a person once loved something that the Bible condemned, or their interpretation of Christianity condemned, and they had to reject that thing. So it's almost like Christianity has a moral standard, and people might disagree about what that moral standard is, but generally people will conform their own moral behavior to what they think that moral standard is. You say that in Texas, one of dwindling few states that still has the death penalty, and which has executed more than five times as many prisoners than the next most lethal state just in the last decade. And this is condoned by the Bible, which commands execution for all manner of crimes and even non-crimes, such as working on weekends or being the victim of rape. So look, the death penalty is a complicated issue. There is an argument to be made from game theory that the death penalty as a form of social enforcement, even of absurd religious taboos, has evolutionary value. But I want to talk about a bigger point. This is the first of several instances where the rational skeptic tries to smuggle in his political issues into the debate. Now, Aaron, I know you're a bourgeois liberal, so it's rather ironic that you're bringing this up because I'm well to the left of you. So I have to wonder, how do you define what is right and wrong since your Bible cannot help you with that? I just gave you the definition from Matthew 19. Have you noticed that the only kind of killing the Bible doesn't condone is when it's done out of mercy? Like when assisted suicide is requested by a terminally ill patient as the only way to preserve their dignity and spare them and their family inevitable but avoidable physical, emotional, and financial torment. Or when an abortion is necessary to save the life of a mother tough choices have to be made sometimes. Whereas your Bible says that you can perform an abortion in Numbers 5 simply to tell whether your wife has been unfaithful. That's hardly moral, is it? So your always, always, always isn't always. It's almost like the Christian moral answer is complicated or something. In the previous episode, we talked about how the scientific and humanist perspective is the correct worldview and definitely not that of Christianity nor of any other religion either. So you've refuted the Hindu slash hoity-toity philosopher version then? When we're talking about the natural world, yes, but you're talking about the supernatural. Now, science cannot even address that because there's no evidence of it, though you believe it anyway, just because you want to, and there's no way to test it because there's no way to falsify it that the mystics would accept. Because you have to believe it regardless, or be damned if you don't, or so you say. Though there's no reason to believe you when you say that. So let's get this out of the way right now. I don't believe in the supernatural in the sense of things being outside of nature. I do believe in the paranormal, which is to say, part of nature that is yet to be explained. Now, as for testing the paranormal, now take this from me, a professional working scientist. The problem with that logic is that science is blind to small effects. In my profession, biology, we typically expect a 95% confidence interval to say that something is statistically significant. That's approximately equal to two and a half standard deviations. So that means that if I have something that has is having a genuine effect, but it's only a small effect. It's an effect that's less than 2.5 standard deviations away from the trial mean. Then I can't statistically tell the difference between that effect and an effect that happened by chance. And so anything that might have a small effect, like say, if I did a magical ritual and it increased the probability of my success from 50% let's say to 55 percent that's a thing that science couldn't tell but let's suppose that i did find rigorous scientific evidence for the paranormal i've talked about this before it's a study by hergovich at all 2015 found that bias in peer review was unlikely to publish evidence for a position not already accepted by science even when that was statistically significant but even so if you wanted to publish a study that, say, refuted astrology, you could publish a subpar 
very poor quality study, and it will still get published because there is a bias in favor of positions that science already agrees with. If you Google atheism, you'll see that it is a disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. This is the common usage. And notice that Google also defines disbelief as an inability or refusal to accept that something is true or real and not necessarily belief that it is false. You can look this up almost anywhere and you'll find the same definition even though most dictionaries were written by Christians. Of course, atheists understand their own position better than you do. American Atheist, for example, says that atheism is one thing, belief in gods, and not necessarily a belief that no gods exist. Look, definitions are meant to be descriptive, not normative. Now, I understand that the lack of belief definition is probably the better definition. However, there are plenty of agnostics who would define atheism the way this minister is and point out that they consider themselves to be distinct from atheists. They even have this nice book on it. But this is richly hilarious because the definition of faith in a Christian context has been pointed out to Aaron over and over and over again, and yet he still continues to say it's belief without evidence when that's not what it means in a Christian context. Here's Christian apologist Tyler Vela defining faith for Aaron to his face in the Christian context. Trying to win by definitional fiat, by saying things like, well, faith is just believing the things that you know ain't so. That's just not what faith is. That's, again, not how we define what faith is. That's the atheist saying, let me define for you what your view is. Look, if we define it this way such that your view is false, then surprise, surprise, your view is false. Again, that's simply question begging. That's just not what biblical faith is. Faith, on the biblical view, is not anything we've heard today. It's not an act of the intellect. It's not actually a belief. It's an act of volition. It's an act of trust. And this has been shown over and over again. Let's see how long it takes him to get it wrong this time. All sins may be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you were. Because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. And we're told to believe this on faith according to an assumption of authority rather than indicative evidence and maybe even in spite of evidence to the contrary. So gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. Well, that didn't take long. St. Peter does not ask whether you know there is a God. No one even can know that, so you don't know it either. Instead, the pearly gatekeeper is supposed to ask whether you believed there was a God. Yes means possible forgiveness and a stairway to heaven. No means a fate worse than death down the highway to hell. If you're an innocent, agnostic, non-theist, doesn't matter, you're all going to hell in the same handbasket. So, whether we're standing at the pearly gates or before a theocratic magistrate, the question before us was never, is there a God? The question imposed upon us throughout history and theology is and always was, do you believe in a God? Whoever or whatever collective cannot answer yes to that question is atheist. They do not have the psychological condition of believing that a God exists. Not every Christian and not every religious believer is a fundamentalist Protestant. Since you are a biblical literalist, that means this is your God. Because you think that if the Bible is wrong, then God is wrong because you can't distinguish doctrine from deity. Well poisoning again. Although, yes, biblical literalists are wrong. Dr. Francis Collins is an evangelical Christian, but he's also an award-winning scientist, and he was the director of the Human Genome Project. He says that, unfortunately, the concepts of Adam and Eve as the literal first couple and the ancestors of all humans simply do not fit the evidence. Listen to the subtle contempt he has in his voice there for Francis Collins. Though we already knew that the myth of Adam and Eve was adopted and adapted from previously pagan mythology and rewritten as a parable that was meant to be interpreted metaphorically. It's only symbolic. Talking snakes and magic trees should have given you your first clue. Well, after the tale of Adam being created by a golem spell. I agree, it is mythology adapted from older mythology. However, the text here is talking about how God speaks the world into existence. Now, anyone who's ever done any programming work at all will know that speaking, or in our case, typing things into existence, is exactly what we're doing. We are creating by speaking. Positive claims require positive evidence. Absolutely, yes. I can think of several classes of positive claims that do not require evidence. So one of those is axiomatic belief. 
a thing that I can't prove, but I need to make as my foundational uh, premise for reasoning. Another kind of positive claim that doesn't require positive evidence is an a priori claim, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Another claim which does not, which is positive but does not require evidence, is a claim that follows logically from a claim that is already evidenced. So, for example, if I can prove to you that I uh, have never been married, then I don't also need evidence for the claim that I've never had to pay alimony, because the second claim follows logically from the first. And if we expand our definition of positive claim to appeal to the best explanation, so not God exists, but God is a better explanation than no God for observed phenomena, then that is an appeal to parsimony rather than direct evidence. You have to be able to show that there's at least some objectively verifiable data just to know whether there is any potential truth to what you're saying. The burden of proof is always on the one making the positive claim. Otherwise, it's just baseless speculation, not even worthy of discussion. Yet, here you are pretending to know that there is a God when you don't have any facts and evidence to back that up. I take it you believe that my pipe exists. Prove that this pipe really exists and isn't just some elaborate illusion. Before we can say whether something is even possible, there must be some precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating whether such a possibility actually exists. We don't have that for your God, which means there is literally not even a possibility that your God exists. The evidence of the hypersensory reality, as evidenced by the fact that our senses are probably incorrect, is the first step along the road to possibility. Science is only concerned with what is supported by evidence. Whatever is not supported doesn't warrant serious consideration. You have to have the evidence to back the claim before you make it, just like you said a moment ago. Because if you don't have that evidence, then your claim is invalid. I could start off with how asking for scientific evidence for God is a category error, but I'm going to save that rant. Right now, though, I want to point out that as a working scientist, we often deal in theoretical sciences, which can often speculate on a wide variety of claims. For example, um, biophysiology of centaurs use existing science principles and theory to apply them to hypothetical situations or counterfactual situations without those claims being absurd. Understand that an unsupported assertion has no more credence than a claim that has already been proven false. And if you're inclined to make unsupported assertions, you will immediately lose all credibility. In any other practice, that would be called lying. Only in religion are out-and-out -out lies rebranded as a revelation of absolute truth. It's like when you make up your own statistics, saying that 50% of the people are like this, or 99.9% .9 of the time it's like that. If you don't have any source to show where you got the data to back that up, and yet you're stating it as a fact, here in Texas, as you know, we call that talking out of your ass. That's what all your claims about absolute truth amount to, just lies. So I don't have to say that your God doesn't exist, except in reply to your empty assertion that he does, until you can show the facts to back that up. You can't say there's no Darth Vader. It doesn't matter that you know who wrote the screenplay for Star Wars and what it was based on, and that all those books and movies are all sensationalized fiction just like your Bible is. You still can't prove there's no Darth Vader because, by your logic, you'd have, to, you'd, have to, you'd have to have searched every planet around every star and all the space between the stars in every galaxy far, far away, and you would have to have already done that a long time ago. So you can't absolutely prove that there is no Darth Vader, but neither can you say that there is one and expect anyone to take you seriously until you have the evidence to back that claim. Well, if a multiverse exists and Darth Vader is logically possible, then modal realism tells us that simply out of probability there must exist a universe in which Darth Vader exists and probably there are infinitely many universes in which Darth Vader exists. We don't have to disprove a negative that was never indicated in the first place. Just as it is true that positive claims require positive evidence, Hitchens' razor says that what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence because we have no reason to believe you. You have to at least show that there's a there there or we have nothing to talk about. So are you going to provide evidence for materialism then? Because if not, then we can dismiss your materialist assertions just as quickly. How much science do you know? More than both of you combined, probably. It's one thing to admit that some undefined something exists that we don't know about, that's certain. But you're talking about a very specific thing. 
What you're doing, that all religious fundamentalists do, is you're committing the logical fallacy of shifting the burden of proof. The philosopher and Nobel laureate Bertrand Russell proposed a nice illustration of the failure of the argument that you're using. He wrote that if there was a teapot, a normal everyday teapot orbiting the sun somewhere in space between Earth and Mars, it would be too small to be seen by telescopes, so you couldn't prove that it's not there. But that's no reason to believe that it is there, and there's no possibility that it could be there. So it would be absurd to even consider it unless there was evidence indicating it. If there's not, then we are perfectly justified in saying that there is no celestial teapot. All right, so let's have this rant. The reason that asking for evidence for God, the same way you would ask for evidence for Bigfoot or Russell's teapot or anything else, is that we're interested in ultimate metaphysical concern here. Like a universe in which Bigfoot exists versus a universe where Bigfoot doesn't exist, or Russell's teapot, or Flying Spaghetti Monster, or whatever, is not a substantially different universe from ones where they don't exist. But a universe where God exists, especially an idealist kind of God that I believe in, is a radically different universe from the materialist world. Right? If idealism is true, God exists. If materialism is true, God doesn't exist. So we're having a metaphysical debate. And metaphysics often comes down to the interpretation or best explanation for evidence rather than evidence itself. So by asking for evidence for God, you are engaging in a category error, which is, last I checked, a logical fallacy. And the same goes for leprechauns. Are we going to have to have the conversation about white liberal racism? Even if they were real, you could search all of Ireland and never find one because we're told that leprechauns are invisible when they want to be. But not only do we know how people like to make up tall tales about supernatural nonsense, we also know that it is biologically impossible for humans to be that tiny or to turn invisible. A Christian preacher even told me that he knows that there's no such thing as leprechauns simply because there's no evidence of them. And I would add that another reason to know that would be that their magic is impossible by definition. So I have not had personal experiences with leprechauns or other types of fairies. But I know people who have, and I'm inclined to believe the legitimacy of their experiences, even if I have yet to personally believe them. Based on my experience, a bunch of people telling me they've seen fairies or experienced fairies is sufficient for me to believe that fairies may well exist. And as far as whether it's physically possible for them to be that small, well, that's going back to our distinction between paranormal and supernatural. I also kind of resent this as a kind of uh, cultural appropriation. You take something from our folklore, my, my culture's folklore, and use it as an example of something silly and fantastical. Just rings of colonialism. We can. There are a few things that are absolute, and we don't know anything absolutely. We don't have perfect or complete knowledge about anything. But within the bounds of reason, yeah. I know that God does not exist to the same degree and for the same reasons that I know that leprechauns don't exist. But this is the precise reason it's a category error, Aaron. We're not asking to know something with the same certainty of like, did God rob a liquor store? We're interested in ultimate concern, and in ultimate concern we're not interested in the same standard of evidence that we're interested in in the court of law. We're interested in ultimate concern. We want, to put all complaint, uh, we want to put all claims in doubt, and we want to know what is really, ultimately, the case. Yeah, I used to be an agnostic atheist myself for about 15 years before I finally got to the point that I realized that gods, ghosts, and magic are not even possible, and that it's silly to even pretend to give such things a benefit of the doubt. So, I'm an anti-theist, or a strong atheist now. I'm an amaterialist for the same reason that you're an atheist. I remain unconvinced that matter really exists, both for philosophical reasons and for the aforementioned scientific undermining of our senses. I'm also an anti-theist because I think it's more likely that matter doesn't exist than it does. But what did you say my position was? I still think that it's an absurdity beneath serious consideration. Oh, right. I can say that you don't know there's a God, because that's a true statement. If you can't show it, you don't know it and you shouldn't pretend that you do. 
name an epistemologist outside of your logical positivist cult who thinks that knowledge is something that is reproducible. Most people accept that knowledge is justified true belief plus whatever their pet theory for the Gettier problem is. Like, suppose my Nona told me something on her deathbed. I can know that thing, but I could never demonstrate it to anyone else because Nona is no longer with us and you don't believe in mediumship so that doesn't work for you either. Yes, I can, definitively, because God, at least your God, is defined by his miraculous nature. And miracles and magic are essentially the same thing, both being the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways that are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics. And anything that defies the laws of physics is physically impossible by definition, and thus God is impossible by extension. Now, magic is a controversial subject in the spiritualist community. I happen to believe in and practice magic. I have several books over here on just that topic. Now, I take magic to be what Aleister Crowley defined magic as, as making a change according to the will, often using spiritual means. Now, magic is not physically impossible. What magic is, is an alteration of the probabilities. It makes something more likely. Again, this increase in likelihood is often really small. And because it's small, we often are unable to tell by science. But when things go your way at an abnormal rate long enough, that's like, oh, well, magic exists. I can say that there's no God logically, too. If God exists beyond time and space, then there is no time and place where or when God exists. Because if God exists outside reality, then he does not exist in reality. That's an equivocation fallacy. You're trading on two different meanings of reality. In one case, you're talking about a multiversal theory of reality or a, an ultimate ground of being reality. And on the other hand, you're talking about universe as reality. This is a clear logical fallacy of equivocation between two different meanings of the word reality. Are you getting why you don't get to call yourself rational, Aaron? Understand that a fool is commonly understood to be one who too readily accepts improbable claims from questionable sources on insufficient evidence. So it's no surprise that the Bible and the Quran both use the opposite definition because the purpose of the scriptures is to fool you. That's why they both demand that you believe on faith or else. That's why they both say that a fool is whoever does not believe impossible nonsense for no good reason. Those who were duped by any of the violently conflicting religions based on these scriptures would say that there is a God because they were fooled into believing that. But what about those who weren't so foolish as to believe such improbable claims from such a questionable source without any evidence at all? When they know that there is no truth to the claim whatsoever, not even a possibility that it could be true, then what would they say? Both you and the Christian are incapable of reading this verse in context, it seems, because that psalm, Psalm 14, is describing the end of days. It describes a period in which everyone has forgotten God and everyone has turned to evil. Now, a lot of times Christians will use this to argue that atheists are inherently evil or that humans are inherently evil, but both of those are wrong readings of this passage. The passage says that after God looks out and find that no one is righteous and find that the fools have said in their heart there is no God, then a righteous generation shall arise and that will kick off the end of days and the coming of the Messiah. So it's about a very specific time in the Jewish cosmology. It is not an ontological statement about all humans or all atheists. Yes, we can say that there is no God if it is in response to your empty assertion that there is one, and we won't even assume the burden of proof if we do that. This only gets you out of it in the hyper-technical specification that a person is claiming, yes, there's a God. If they were, on the other hand, claiming it is more rational to believe in theism than atheism, then just providing no argument is effectively conceding their point. That is generally how debate works. When you don't refute a claim, you've effectively conceded it. Really, really believing something is the same thing as knowing it. As if the power of positive thought could change reality if you could just believe hard enough. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. So they have to convince themselves and assert their conviction with certainty. Like when this country music singer said on Fox News, I know there's a God. There's a, I yeah. know for a fact and there's Ellen, a God. I, I like but it's not a fact. A fact is a point of objectively verifiable data, and you can't demonstrate that. 
So you don't really know it either, because knowledge is testable and demonstrable. You can show what you know. But if you can't confirm the accuracy of your claims to any degree at all, by any means whatsoever, then you cannot actually know what you merely believe. If I show you what I know, the result is that you'll know it too. But if you show me what you know, it'll turn out that you didn't really know it either. This is the third episode we've done on this topic, and so far you haven't given any reason yet to believe in a God, much less any justification for your claim to know that there is one. So what are the facts and evidence that justify your claim? How do you know what no one even can know and therefore can only believe on faith? Once again, I am not required to demonstrate what I know, but also, are you going to demonstrate your claim that the material world really exists and isn't an illusion? A quick search on Facebook returned more Thomas Millers than I care to count. However, I found only one Facebook for God. It's a public figure page, not his own personal timeline, and someone else was running it, which is how it always is with God. We're supposed to believe that God is all-powerful, yet he always needs people to do his work for him. He can allegedly create planets and dinosaurs and anything humans can't make, but he can't make anything humans can make. He can't make a box or a boat or a building. He can't even write his own book. Isn't it funny that a ghost needs a ghost writer? Someone else far less competent or capable always has to do all of God's work for him, as if he can't really do anything himself, as if he was never really there. Christian deism is a thing. Positive claims require positive evidence. No, they don't. You said there was a Thomas Miller, and you presented the evidence to back that claim. There's Thomas Miller. Very good. Now, can you do that with your God? There's Jesus right there in the front row. Say hi to everybody. You can all see that Rabbi Yeshua ben Yosef came in to see us today, or so that we could see him. Prove my pipe exists, Aaron. Prove it. I mean... I hear that nothing is impossible for your God, that he can break all the laws of physics at once just because you asked him to in a prayer. If you really believe that he can do absolutely anything, then have him say hi, like Pastor Thomas did. Why can't your God do what any normal person who really exists can do? Christian deism is a thing, Aaron. Dear non-intervening God, this is getting repetitive. No, science does not assert that this or that does not exist. Instead, we adhere to the null hypothesis, meaning that unsupported assertions are not considered valid. We're not going to believe you just because you say so. You need evidence to show whether something is possible, much less probable. For example, if a faith healer says that he can expel demons or cure some disease just by kicking you in the crotch, provided you give him a thousand dollar vow of faith first, or if someone with the mind of a child says that obstetricians don't know what they're talking about because they're all part of a conspiracy that wants to teach sexual reproduction in school against God's will, all while suppressing stork theory, then you'll have a good idea what it's like when creationists try to argue against evolution. Or perhaps if someone who draws cartoons for a living says that the well-supported theory of plate tectonics is bunk and that the earth is actually growing inexplicably, or maybe that it's flat and that the whole universe orbits around us, we would not give any of these ideas credence until they earned it. We don't have to disprove something that hasn't even been substantiated, especially when there is already evidence against it. The truth is what the facts are. If you can't show me the truth of it, then you can't honestly say whether there is any truth to it. What we call the material world is an illusion. That this illusion can be overcome by going deep in our senses. That in this meditative experience we encounter a universal mind, the ground of being God. That's what Hindus argue. That's what a version of what Kant argued. That's what Plato argued. That's what I'm saying. It's plausible because we both know that evolutionary biology understands that our senses are flawed. It's plausible because of all the philosophical argumentation. And you have provided no evidence that we should take seriously that materialism is true and that we can be certain of that. That's the plausibility argument, Aaron. Those are just additional assertions of subjective impressions. You can say that there is a Thomas Miller because you have demonstrable evidence to validate that claim. There's Thomas Miller sitting in the front row. Now, where is Jesus? Is there any fact that indicates your Jesus or his alleged father, the God of Abraham, who is still worshiped by the Jews and Muslims? They're the ones who still keep that very first commandment that you Christians are breaking. Unitarianism is also a thing. Is there evidence of this God or of any God from any religion or anything supernatural at all? Can you produce any fact indicating that these gods and ghosts you believe in currently exist anywhere outside of human imagination? 
Why is experience invalid when it's only a small group of people who have the experience? Why does it have to be a common experience before it can be regarded as valid? Either we reject all sense data or we accept all sense data. This democracy of sense data makes no sense. Imagine, if you will, a world in which the majority of people are blind. You are one of the few people who see in color. Now try to convince the a colorist that color exists. What argument could you use against them? I imagine the a colorist would use every same argument that you and every rational skeptic uses against those who have the experience of the spiritual. There is a God because I've met him. No, you haven't. I talk with him. No, you don't. And he's my friend. No, he isn't. How do you know his experiences are invalid, Aaron? How do you know? Having a magic imaginary friend is not like having a real friend. When you talk to Pastor Thomas, he can disagree with you and he can teach you things you didn't already know. Your God can't do either of these things because when you talk to God, you're only talking to yourself. When other people talk to your God, they get different answers that contradict the answers that you get. None of you can ever learn any new information that you could not have already known because your God doesn't know any more than you do. Nor can your God have corrected any of the many errors you've already committed in the sermon before you shared it to 30,000 some odd people. Because your God should know everything I do too. But the reason that your God is just as stupid as you are is because he is who you are. And he is no more than you are. In fact, he is less than you are because his existence depends entirely on you and your belief in him. So I don't believe that we're actually talking to God in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? I think this is either a spirit or the interaction of God through us. Now, I've had conversations with spirits that, like, I violently disagreed with, and that was one of the first things that keyed me in, that I wasn't really talking to myself, which is, you know, always a doubt that we have, because we want to be intellectually honest. I know that's rare for this rational skeptic. But, yeah, of course, uh, when the when I think, say, that a spirit will say one thing and it goes, nope, you're wrong, uh, that, that indicates that we're not talking to ourselves. Also, yes, there have been several instances, of course, we don't know if they actually got them, but instances of people saying, I was told this idea by a spirit and it turned out to be true, or they claim divine inspiration. Divine inspiration is a thing that goes back, you know, to the muses. Um, the Indian mathematician Ramanujan attributed many of his discoveries to a Hindu goddess, and Alfred Russell Wallace later in life attributed his theory of evolution to the spirits. He claimed to have seen evolution in a, a dream, in a vision, and then later when he started to believe in spirits, he said, ah, I know, the spirits revealed evolution to me in a dream. So we spiritualists have a, a fond place in our hearts for evolution. You might get wise one day and he'll just go away, vanishing in a puff of logic. And your fanatical materialism might go away in a puff of intellectual honesty. And if that ever happens, you will become more tolerant and more curious. That's a statistical trend that we've noticed that usually happens with pastors when they give up their faith. I'm still well to the left of you politically, Aaron. But when you're talking about God, you're not talking about a normal person. We're talking about an extraordinary person, meaning that your evidence must be that much more profound. Finding a Facebook account is good enough evidence for regular people like Thomas Miller, but you'll need a whole lot more than that for a highly dubious and contested claim like your God. So extraordinary that the whole universe would be different on our different accounts, which is why asking for evidence of that God is a category error. So would it be foolish of you to say that Paul Bunyan or Pecos Bill don't exist? Where are the religions claiming that Paul Bunyan and Pecos Bill exist? I mean, you do live in Texas, so it's entirely possible, but... Is it foolish for you to say that Vishnu doesn't exist? 800 million Hindus say that he does. That's more than every Protestant Christian denomination combined with Mormons, JWs, and everyone except the Catholics. I believe that Vishnu exists as a spirit, not as the ultimate Brahmanic God, but I believe Vishnu exists. Would it be foolish of you to say that Santa Claus doesn't exist? After all, he, uh, he has more in common with Jesus than you'll likely admit. Have you ever been to the North Pole? Yeah, let's come back to that in about two months' time.
Even though Godzilla is obviously fictional and his existence would defy the laws of physics just like your God, you think your inability to find or disprove Godzilla proves that it's possible that he could exist. That's according to your logic. <laughs> That's why the world doesn't use your logic. It doesn't use your logic either, Aaron. Generally, the world refrains from straw mans, tries to find the correct definitions, doesn't commit category errors every five seconds, you know, generally is open to the possibility that philosophy is valid and isn't a fanatical positivist or materialist. The impossible nonsense like gods and monsters do not warrant serious consideration. To a new age of gods and monsters. always wanted to say that. The Nobel Prize winning mathematician John Forbes Nash met his college roommate Charles Herman when he started at university. All right, I knew we'd get to the reactionary politics eventually. Most of these rational skeptics end up goose-stepping. So here comes a long, sad description of John Forbes Nash and equating his very real struggles and the struggles of drug addicts with your position that religion is delusional. So ableism and trivializing the opioid epidemic and drug addiction generally. And he spoke with his friend frequently for many years afterward, even though no one else could ever see Charles Herman. Nor could anyone see many of Nash's other friends that he alone met and talked with. Even when other people interceded to say, who are you talking to, John? There's no one there. So having heard your evidence of God, I'm inclined to ask, is he in the room with us right now? And do you have any other friends that only you can see or hear? There was a moving scene in the movie about John Nash, wherein his wife had to explain to him that all these people he knew and, and had been talking to for years didn't really exist. He rejected this, of course, because he could not consider the truth, just like you can't either. A few years ago, the National Alliance on Mental Illness defined delusion as a persistent false belief that is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary, to falsely claim something even when there is evidence otherwise. And what makes these beliefs delusional is that they don't change when the person is presented with conflicting information. The beliefs remain fixed even when the facts contradict them. By this definition, your religion definitely qualifies as a delusion, and for that reason, NAMI later changed their definition, saying that it's not a delusion if it is shared by the surrounding community. Literally the special pleading fallacy that it's okay when religion does it. But that still shows that the old adage is correct, that when one person has a delusion, it's called insanity. But when many people have a delusion, it's called religion. It starts when you encourage prayer, actively talking to your imaginary friend. It doesn't have to be a god either. It could be your spirit totem or the ghosts of your dead ancestors or aliens from outer space communicating telepathically. It could even be your soccer ball, Wilson. The point is, if you talk to any imaginary character long enough, eventually they'll start talking back. So who wants a shower after that? Don't worry, he will come back to this. If there really were a billion people claiming that they met God and talked with him and he's their friend, then I would have to say that at least most of them are friends with a different God than yours. And just for one famous example, look at George Harrison of the Beatles. He believed in a personal God, and he said that if, he, if one chants the mantras with devotion, Lord Krishna would visibly appear and speak to him in an audible voice. He said that it's pointless to believe in something without proof, and Krishna consciousness and meditation are methods where you can actually obtain God perception. You can actually see God and hear him, play with him. It might sound crazy, but he's actually there, actually with you. So, Pastor Morris, should we believe George Harrison that his God is actually with him? Is it enough that Harrison said that he knows Krishna exists because he met him, he talked with him, and they're friends? How is it possible that Lord Krishna talks to George Harrison and millions of other Hindus and Jesus talks to you? One possibility, the only possibility, is that neither of you has ever actually met or talked with or befriended either of these imaginary beings. So why do both of you have these fictitious friends? For the same reason that millions of other people have met and talked with and befriended their gods. I know a professional medical technician who lives not two miles from me who worships the Egyptian cat-headed goddess Bast because she appeared to him visibly 
She embraced him physically and she spoke to him audibly, asking him to become her disciple, which of course he did because how do you say no when a topless goddess shows up in your bedroom? So this guy and George Harrison both know their God exists for the same reasons that you don't really know your God exists either. It's all in your imagination. It is literally make-believe. It's not real. Jesus and Krishna and Bast and all the other gods do exist just as spirits. Faith is inherently auto-deceptive. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. It can cause you to see, hear, and feel any God from any pantheon. Whatever religious traditions you were raised with will most likely recur in adulthood. Faith can convince you that your spiritual form can project out of your body and that you can remember past life experiences and commune with spirit guides on a Ouija board. And faith can also convince you that you are receiving telepathic transmissions from extraterrestrial reptiles or thetans giving you secret information about the Illuminati. None of that has to be real at all for you to experience it all through faith. If you could just believe hard enough. Differences in the accounts are based in part on differences of interpretation and on differences in what spirits interact with which group. I know some people are going to accuse me of being a focus just for saying that, but it's true. It's the equivalent of the A colorist going, ha, when I ask a Swede what color people are, he says white, and when I ask a Kenyan, he says black. But what if the truth mattered more than whatever you'd rather pretend? What if you didn't want to be fooled into believing anything that wasn't evidently true? Your first step in the pursuit of truth is to question and seriously challenge your faith. Truth does matter. It's an open question as to whether or not we can access it. But we are not going to arrive at truth by asserting that materialism exists and is true and asserting that science is the only way of knowing things about it. We need to be consistent skeptics. We need to doubt matter. We need to doubt science. It's only through that methodological skeptical process that we can ever have a hope of arriving at truth. It's not faith. It's consistent personal experience across many people in time, place, and culture. People can be rational, logical, and reasonable, but we can also be emotionally manipulated, leading to very addictive sensations. Supposed supernatural spiritualism appeals to the very same area of the brain as illicit narcotics, which is why those people who are especially fond of drugs also tend to be especially susceptible to religion. That's why so many converted Christians were formerly drug-addicted alcoholics. They're simply trading one addiction for another, with similar effects, but more socially acceptable. I told you we'd be back to the reactionary politics, ableism, and trivializing of drug abuse, didn't I? Had I been that guy that you're talking about, then as soon as you started in with the Gospels, I would have called you out for having broken your promise. I wanted to meet God right now, and instead of that, you got out your meaningless and self-contradicting storybook. This is like the A colorist in our hypothetical scenario asking, show me your color right now. And me carefully explaining to the A colorist that we have lots of reasons to believe in color, but unless you have a certain level of biological ability, you can't participate in that evidence. Show me your God. I mean, Christians can't even have free will, logically, for a few reasons. Not if God already knows everything you're going to do before you do it. If everything is preordained and you can't surprise him and ruin his prophecy, then you don't have free will. Especially not if you've got the threat of the hell, like a gun to your head, because extortion doesn't allow for a free choice either. We're two minutes from the end. Free will is a complicated philosophical topic. I'm not going to do it in a witty quip. Uh, let's just give this to him and move on. And there's a whole lot wrong with God sending his supposed son to be a scapegoat as just one of several conditions for his unconditional love, a sacrifice that never needed to be made because he could have just forgiven us for something that wasn't wrong anyway, and that never actually happened in the first place. But those are all topics for a different conversation. Well, I'm glad he's moving on. But that's essentially the problem with Trinitarian Christianity. It's completely incoherent. Unitarian and deist forms of Christianity can overcome this. And certainly works-based forms of Christianity can overcome this, which is why Protestantism is the silliest of all forms of Christianity. As if your delusion ever had any comparable validity at all. 
as if superstition and reason were two sides of the same coin, which they are not. We're literally comparing fact versus fantasy. Yeah, but we're disagreeing about what is superstition and what is reason. And it's clear that you don't seem very interested in improving your reason, as evidenced by all the times we've pointed out your flaws, and you don't correct them. Now, if we're going to talk about fantasy, isn't it entirely possible that the world we see around us and its study is a fantasy, a matter fantasy? You still haven't given a satisfactory response to that hoity-toity philosopher. You cannot admit or allow your quarry to know that atheism simply means that we don't believe you. Because that means that you have to come up with a reason why we should. And believers hate the burden of proof like a vampire hates garlic. I've come to suck your logic. Because you don't have a good reason. Which is why you rely on fallacious arguments in lieu of evidence. That's what happens when you take up drugs or religious delusion, both being similarly addictive. That's the reason that former smokers are the most outspoken anti-smokers. That's the reason that former believers are the most outspoken anti-theists. You're telling me that you got your friend high and that he's an addict now, spreading the addiction. If you had heard drug users bragging the same way you have, I'm sure you would have the same reaction to them that I'm having to you. And we're back to trivializing drug addiction again. So you already know that you are the dopamine dealer for 30,000 congregates and that they will pay a high price for that fix. Capitalism, Aaron. It's not a harmless fantasy, either. Religion is a means of manipulation of the masses to extort, support, and secure social, financial, and political power. Look, I'm all down for criticizing the power of institutionalized religion. It's the opiate of the masses, to be sure, and it institutionally supports the views of the bourgeoisie over, say, proletarian views of religion. Like, for example, Martin Luther King uh, isn't promoted nearly as much in his own lifetime as, say, Jerry Falwell was. But political implications of religion are entirely separate from the validity of the experience of the believers. Drugs and religion are both life-changing, but the same thing happens when you take up education or activism or dedicate yourself to any other passion. The implication there is that education is incompatible with religion as a passion. Uh, that's just absurd on its face. I'm both a scientist and science educator, and yet I am both religious and actively involved in advocating for my religious positions. The day I finally realized that atheism didn't really mean what you and certain philosophers always told me it meant, the day I realized that label actually applied to me, that was life-changing because it meant that I'd been lied to all my life and that I should do something to save others from the indignity of being duped by the deliberately misleading misinformation that your ministry is spreading now. And the moment I realized that my prior certainty about the nature of the material world that my science education had beat into my head, the moment I realized that I could no longer support that intellectually was the day I opened up and in fact became a more tolerant individual because I realized that my positions were no more well supported than the creationists and the Christians that I, as an atheist, anti-theist activist, was always clashing with. All right, we're done. That was a long slog, and I know we descended into mockery. Um, if I do these responses to skeptics videos in the future, they certainly won't be this long because it's tired and uh, it's tiring and I think I've broken my mind uh, just responding to this toxic nonsense. Like, I felt sick listening to it at some points. But, finally, being able to take all these arguments and just go through them, uh, it, it's very, very cathartic. This has been the planned inaugural episode of the science medium i'm your science medium and creepy puppeteer tommy wishing you the best of luck as we go forward with whatever this horrible year has left in store for us <laughs>